Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, whatever time it is where you are. I'm Malcolm Hawker, the host of the CDO Matters podcast. Welcome to our podcast today. I am happy to be joined by Veronica Durgan, who is the VP of Data at Saks. Now, I, I want to keep. I want to say just naturally, Saks Fifth Avenue. When? When did? Maybe I'm just not with it. When did you rebrand? Is I think it happened. Well, hello everyone. Hey, Malcolm. <laughs> <That's Veronica. Thank> <laughs> I was like, are yeah, you? what a great intro. It's like, it was like <laughs> just pull the rug out from under you and start talking about the name of Sex Fifth Avenue like anybody cares. But but anyway, yes. L l let's dive right in. Uh, yeah. It happened, I think, three years ago. Oh. Okay. Uh, in in kind of like it was a post COVID thing, and we wanted to focus on kind of digital experience and bring that beautiful Sex Fifth Avenue you know, special experience to our online. Um, All right. I, I thank you. I did. I did want to touch on your company name because I, I know for, for a lot of Luddites like me who were not very fashion inclined, I'm not, um, you, you who may hear Saxon not know what that is. So that's, that's, that's why I wanted to touch on it. Cause it's for, for people like me who live in a cave, um, it's, it's Saks Fifth Avenue. So it, it's fair. And I get that often too. It's like Goldman Sachs. I'm like, no, Saks Fifth Avenue. Wonderful. That, and so, so that's why I wanted to touch on that. So, so thank you so much, Veronica, for, for joining today. I met you for, in person the first time at CDOIQ this summer in Boston, just to, in your in your hometown of well, not home, but where you're living now in in Boston. But I think I think we had traded a few things on LinkedIn before that. I had certainly known of you, and I, and I think you had mentioned that maybe you had caught some of the episodes of the podcast of the, before. But we sat down, and it was a morning breakfast. I, I I'm pretty sure. Maybe it was a very long meal. Uh, maybe it was just a very long lunch. <laughs> well, that was, that was probably because you got stuck talking to me um, that, 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 ma that made it long. But to, to make a long story short, um, we, we hit it off having a conversation and I really enjoyed talking to you. And at that moment, I was like, aha, um, if I enjoy the conversation, well, then maybe others might enjoy the conversation too. And that's why we are where we are today. So thanks for joining. Happy Friday. Indeed. Yeah, we, we did meet at the CDO IQ. I, I've been following you before that. I was internally, secretly, and I know I've, you know, maintained cool face, like fangirling over everybody sitting at that table. Uh, and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, like, this is so cool. Uh, so super happy to be here. You and me, you and me both. So that's kind of what's cool about CDO IQ. And, and I had said this in a previous episode and I did a kind of an episode summary, I think with, with Scott Taylor, when we were talking about this, I had, this, I had this, I had fanboy moments as well. And it was like, kind of like surreal, right? Um, I think the story I was telling was, I was reading this really great article in Harvard Business Review about the impacts of AI, I think, I don't know exactly, but I was like, this is a great article. This is, this is awesome. And of course, you know, written by Randy Bean. And then, you know, I sit down and, and you know, at the, t at the breakfast table and there's Randy Bean, which was, which was cool. Um, so I was having those moments too. So Veronica, I would, I'd love to start first with the story of you. I, I'd love to hear kind of like your data journey, your career journey, and how, how you kind of where you started and, and where you got to. I, I think I think it's an interesting story that that our listeners would would love to hear. Yeah, absolutely, and it's kind of like it's very interesting. I I both enjoy sharing my story and not. It's it's awkward talking about myself, but so here <laughs> we go. I'll start from the the beginning. Uh, I've or maybe I'll start from the end, actually. I've spent my entire career on data, but I still kind of fell into it. So, and here's what happened. So um, you're probably picking up on a little bit of accent and I like to mess with people, just asking them to figure out where I'm from, but um, I still have a little bit of accent. So I immigrated to the United States when I was 17 years old. So I finished high school. I am originally from Russia. We moved here just slightly after the Soviet Union collapse. Um, so I finished school there, fully bilingual, and I actually started medical school. So my parents were pushing me to be a doctor, just like I'm sure many can relate to that. So when we came here, uh, 
we came here as refugees. Basically, we had no money. We just brought like a bag of clothes each. And we came here to succeed for opportunities and to work hard and to get somewhere. So spent about a year kind of like learning English. I knew the alphabet and maybe how to ask for apple juice when I moved here. So spent a year studying English and then went to college. So my entire kind of like um, graduate education is here. So I learned a lot of things in English. I'm actually not very good at translating back and forth, which is odd. Um, but I went to college as pre-med. The difference here is that medical degree is a graduate degree. So I started uh, as biology major. I actually have an undergrad degree in biology. I hated everything about biology. <laughs> I'm sorry to those of you who love it. Um, I went to a marine biology lab once and I, I kind of walked away. I'm like, this smells like fish. <laughs> like, <laughs> Fish and that stuff they use to preserve I, animals, like, the uh, cadavers, so that you can cut into them, right? Whatever that stuff. I'm is. like, no, I. This is not what I want to do. I am not passionate about medicine, and and I feel like to be in medicine, you really have to be passionate for it. Like it's it's a long journey. It's tough. It's it's hard psychologically, hard it's physically, hard. So I wasn't really into it. Um, while I was still in college, I got a job processing blood, preparing blood for testing. So I started a hospital lab and kind of transitioned into data entry. Uh, we had these like, now this is like late 90s. Um, we had these like dumb terminals, I think Med, Med, Med Tech, Med Tron, whatever the app was. And apparently it was confusing to everybody. I think it's still around. And I was like, huh, this makes sense. So this is my journey into like, oh, I can work with, with computers. Uh, as I was working there, uh, my coworker said, hey, my husband's looking for a um, computer operator. I was like, all right, sounds computer cool. Computer operator, that's awesome. What yeah, so I was like, all right, that's awesome. So so still getting my undergrad degree, went, got that job. So this time, you know, this point in time, working full time, going to college full time. And I was like, oh, this is cool. This is where I kind of like learned Microsoft Access. Uh, I'm like, well, I like this. Uh, as I graduated, I got a job as a junior DBA. My God, felt like just, I was like, I get it. I love it. I want to know more about it. So, and I'm like, okay, but I kind of know nothing about technology, like at all. I have like no background whatsoever. Um, so I am like, I need to get a master's degree. And at the time there was no master's degree in data. So I ended up getting a master's degree in software engineering. 100% not a waste of time. I learned about software development methodologies. I learned about project management. I learned to code. Uh, never really used it. Like VB.net, I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool, but never really applied it. Just continued moving through data. Um, the other interesting thing is, <laughs> which is kind of funny, I almost failed animal biology um, because not only did I have to memorize all the like the Latin names, like taxonomies, I also didn't know the words in English. So I had to like translate <laughs> to English and then to another word. And to this day, I hate when we call things with names that don't make sense. I hate code project <laughs> names. I was like, can you make it clear this double hop? I'm like, I just can't. It's like learning two languages at the same time. So it just kind of like a funny story um i guess the other thing is you know and this is something that we don't talk a lot about and i know you and i kind of touched up on that when we met before uh being a working parent so uh we're a household of two working parents um it comes in like if you see my title linkedin it's like chief mom officer it's not like i know it's like cute funny, whatever, but it is the reality. Uh, so I was getting my master's degree, uh, working full time and having a newborn all at the same time. Uh, it takes a lot of like, it's operationally, like logistically, you have to figure it out. Uh, I haven't slept for like 10 years <laughs> at some point. <laughs> so I was like, you just function, like you, your life becomes very agile. It's like, what do I do next day? You don't plan like, what do I do 10 years from now, right? Like like tomorrow, I just need to survive one day at a time. Be agile, live in the agile life, like literally. 
that's it that's pretty it, much it's, it it's like yeah it's the, it's the mvp of every day <laughs> yeah it's like i made it <laughs> it sounds like well th thanks for sharing I, I i i i just love hearing these stories um like i i can't even imagine what it would be like being dropped into this country not knowing the language like as as a canadian you may you may think this is odd but as a canadian it was hard enough for me being dropped away from everything that I knew and my friends and 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 in, into a into a foreign country and yes there are differences between you as a Canada but not even knowing the language I, I can't even imagine that 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 what do you when you look back what do you think are the is the one or two things that you're most grateful for but because you came from somewhere else because you had to learn English what what are the things that you kind of hold really tightly now and say wow at the time maybe that was really hard or, or, you know, at the time it, it seemed impossible, but now you look back that you're most grateful for. So first of all, honestly, and I'll be patriotic here for a second, the opportunity that I had to come here, period. This is, I, I there is no, I can't describe the appreciation of having that opportunity to be here and to become what I am. There was nobody actively blocking me from working hard and succeeding. If you work hard, you succeed. The other interesting thing is learning a foreign language is very interesting because this is very similar to learning business language, right? I'm an engineer. I need to learn to speak the language of, you know, the business people that I'm working with. It's very similar. Right. Like you now have to learn different words, different phrases. So in, in a way, like, yeah, that's the same thing. So um, every company I work for, I have to learn a new language, if you will, of how they speak, of how they understand. That's why, like, I don't I try not. I, I actually get very excited when I find the right word. Uh, it's completely dorky. But, you know, let, let's let's figure out what the words are and what the meaning of those words are. And let's move forward. So to, to paraphrase what, what I, if I were to put it into kind of one word would be maybe a spirit of gratitude, right? That's what I'm, that's what I'm hearing. I'm, I'm hearing gratitude for the opportunity to, to, to be here and to work and to succeed and, and to, to live your life. So I, I, that's, that's what I think I'm hearing. Do you, do you agree? hundred. Oh, absolutely. hundred percent. Uh, okay. yeah. I, I like I have a lot of words, but if you want to put it into one, uh, yeah, it's it's being in a different country. Um, I know you're from Canada, and we're kind of like, eh, Canada's the same in the U.S., which is not. Uh, but being in a country that is quite very different from the United States, it yeah. it truly opens your eyes to the opportunities that we have here that I've never had there ever. Yeah. And, and believe it or not, I can actually say the exact same thing. And that's, that is the opportunity is the number one reason why I'm here and why I will die here. So I, I'm not one of those immigrants that will say, oh, it's better back there. It's, better. it's not. This, this is, this is the place to be. This is the place I choose to be. This is, this is home. And we have the greatest potential, I think, of any country on the planet. I'm with you 100%. Go USA. All right. So when we talk about Kind of the world of data leaders and and big challenges and how do we overcome those challenges? What are some of the things that kind of high level, without without going into into too much detail, with your individual company? What what are some of the things that you're seeing in the market, kind of high level, as some of the the, the bigger challenges that that we need to be focused on as a community? Um. Oh my gosh. I think. I. For me, every company, like we talk about it, it's on like, are they all similar or are they all unique? I think as a data leader, you need to focus on problems you need to solve at your immediate company. And then basically use almost like a Lego piece by piece and, and put your, you know, whether it's strategy or platform together, that is solving problems of your current company. I see the satan where we're like, oh, this is cool. Let's bring it in. Or like, oh, I wish I could do something at my previous company, so I'm going to do it here. Uh, we kind of miss like, no, there, there are you know, distinct problems in front of you. Solve them. So it's kind of where my mind's at. 
Well, when we had talked previously, one one of the things that that you had you had kind of groused about um, was was this was this idea of kind of consultants swooping in and swooping out, and vendors swooping yeah. in and swooping out. Tell me more. Yeah, so I I ranted about a ton. Actually, I'm gonna say something. So at the CDO IQ, there was a conversation around the type of data leaders that a company wants to have. And I walked away from, and there was like, I think CDO panel, I walked away from that panel being incredibly frustrated. And I was frustrated because the message was, oh, uh, one of the messages was, if you can write you know, a 30 page memo, you're the greatest data leader. I disagree with that. I think depending on the maturity of the company, uh, uh, what they've done in the past, what they're trying to do, you need to bring a specific type of leader at that point in time. Or like, I actually, I, I, I was driving home and I, was, I spent many days thinking about it. Like, are we looking for unicorns who don't exist? Or are we saying it's not my problem and blaming somebody else? Or are we saying I am the best? Right. The reality is companies change. And like I always I often say that jobs are like relationships. You have a relationship with the company. Sometimes it's just bad, like you're not good for each other. Sometimes you grow out of that relationship, right? I don't know if you're married, I don't know how you've been married. Maybe you are you were with your partner for a long time, or sometimes you're with them for a short time, sometimes you're them with them for a long time, and then you break up because you just grew apart. So at each stage of the company, of each stage of the data maturity, you need a specific type of leader. And as a leader, it's honestly on me to realize whether what what does my company, my team need? Am I fitting into that? Can I change to fit into that? Or is this it for our relationship? And I need to move on and they need to hire somebody who better fits that specific you know, situation. So you had, you'd mentioned the word unicorn, um, l- love it. Um, the, the, the joke, well, I, re- I recall when we were talking before, the, the way that you described a unicorn was very kind of similar to how, how I described one. I think you said, what, rem- remind me your description of the unicorn, if you recall it. Well, I don't remember what I said, probably like perfect, somebody who's just like perfect all around technical business. You're, you're like everything in one package. Yeah. Yeah, the, the the joke I tell is is one half business, one half t- one half technical, and one half sales. Right. Mm-hmm. So so you know yeah. the joke is if, if it's well, of course it's yeah. three it's three halves, right? You're, you're, um, yeah. you're but, one but, and a half person, yes. <laughs> well, yes, very much. But you need well, you need to be. So for the you as a unicorn, um, it it seems you like your background is not exclusively, but is is reasonably tilted towards technology, mm-hmm. right? You're a database administrator. You you have a master's degree in computer science. That's pretty that's pretty tech centric. What what specifically have you done, and what what have you seen that that has been effective over your career to get more rooted on the business side? Uh, learning uh, honestly, again, like learning a foreign language, continuously learning. Um, I again like. I know my limitations. Like I am not a pure strategist at all. My strategy automatically means me thinking how to implement it. I can't disconnect. I know it's my shortcoming. It's also my superpower. So I know that I will fit perfectly into specific company, specific situation at their specific step of their growth. But if they ever need me to transition in purely strategic role, I will be horrible at it and I would hate it on top of it. I would be like, it would be the most miserable job I've ever had. Uh, so I, I know like I am not a unicorn at all. I'm very like self-aware what I'm good at, what I'm not good at. Um, but I am trying to kind of like learn that foreign language of trying to understand the business from their side, completely removing any sort of technological and engineering thing. But my brain automatically thinks of how to implement something like it just how it works. And and I'm like, I I am at peace with that. I know where like I don't need to be where I'm not good at it. I don't contribute. So that's kind of. So has that got but but I'm prone to detail as well. 
Um, <laughs> when it comes to problem solving, I, I, I tend to rip at things just like endlessly. For for me, and I, and I know this is true for a lot of other folks as well, um, when you're trying to learn something new, there's always a question of depth, right? How, how, how detailed do I need to, in my case, I, I came from the business side. I'm not a technologist. Um, I, I, I was on the business side. I was a chief product officer. I was a product manager. I, I learned the, tr the trade of product management and I applied it to data. And for me, I always wrestled with, well, how deep do I need to go, right? Like how, how much do I need to know? And I learned a few things along the way I, I can certainly share, but I, I would love to hear your perspective on, well, how, how deep do you need to go? Is, is, it, is it transactional or is it more strategic or, or how do you draw the line? Do you need to understand, you know, in the case of Sonos, we were, we were just talking about, you know, <laughs> how, how the terminals work. That's the engineering side. How, how deep would you need to go on the business side in order to, to become comfortable? Uh how deep to go on the business side so yeah. i actually i'm gonna mention something so um there is a book uh by Tzadal neely and i can't remember her co-author she's a professor at harvard business school called the digital mindset and one of the things she talks about is the 30 percent rule which i absolutely love and can relate to and what she says is that for somebody to speak english well enough to be at the table have a conversation they need to know 30 percent of the words so and and i'm like this is exactly it i need to understand 30 percent of something to have a meaningful conversation with that person i want to know 100 percent of everything it's not possible but it just how my brain rolls but 30 percent is enough to have a meaningful conversation so that's no, awesome. you don't have to go all the way deep, but you need to have enough depth. That's really compelling. And it's about language and it's about mm -hmm. understanding. So I think that's a really useful paradigm, whether you're coming from the business and looking at technology, whether you're coming from technology, looking at the business, can, can, can you be coherent enough? 30% coherent. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I don't know how to measure that, right? Like the tech, here we go with technologists is like, well, how would you exactly would you measure that? How would you Well, like, I mean, maybe it's like simple words too, right? Like do right, you understand 30% right. of that technology right. paper? If you do, you you will have a meaningful conversation. Yeah. That's to me it's always a bit of a balancing act. I found success in in my past and this seems a little counterintuitive, but being rather transactional in what I learn and what I don't learn. I mean, meaning like if I need to learn a technology, I'll, I'll give, a, I'll give a good example. Um, one of the, one of the, one of the big projects I was involved at a long time ago at this little software company called America online was I was put in charge of, of, of making portions of their advertising infrastructure speak Japanese, right? Like to, international character sets. So, so back in the day when everything was old school ASCII, like seven bit ASCII, mm -hmm. And we're like, oh my gosh, how, how are we going to make this thing actually like, you know, multiple bytes wide? And, and, mm -hmm. and, and it was all about being able to sell search terms. And we, we had built a, a business around selling um, English language search, ter search terms on AOL. And it was Google picked that up and is now what Google is because of that. But we were wanting to figure out, okay, how do we sell search terms in Japanese? And I was like, I don't know anything about engineering. I don't know anything about this stuff. And now I don't know anything about Japanese. So I'm like, five times you know behind on what i need to learn and i figured out maybe it ended up being about 30 percent of mm -hmm. like you know what does unicode mean <laughs> right <laughs> what does multi-byte mean what does these actually mean and like i learned that like every character on the keyboard is actually a number right like mm -hmm. like it, it corresponds to a number and i was like this oh wow that's uh, uh, like so that, that's, that's my little tidbit, which is I, I learned just enough to be slightly intelligent, to speak with slight intelligence, you know, and at least have a conversation with engineers so that they wouldn't laugh me out of the room. Yeah. So. See, but then you need I'm to have engineers who like truly know the depth of things. That's the other part, right? Like as, as you go up into like leadership roles or maybe even like principal roles or architect roles you need to still have a team that knows something in depth to actually implement it. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. You, you, yeah. And, and, and this is, this has been true in my experience with um, the, the tech and business 
in, in, a, in a corporate ladder as well, right? If, if you are an extremely technical data leader, then, then you need somebody who is at your side who is not. Yep. Have you, have you experienced the same? Yeah, you balance out. Like you, you have to fill in the gaps. So that's like as long as your team is complete, right? Like your team has to be unicorn, but not anybody individually. So and that's another thing I think us as humans, we oftentimes don't understand that. We think we're perfect. We're not. Once right. we realize we're not, then we can like build a team that is collectively perfect. I love it. I love it. Aspire to that at the very least. Well, speaking of, of technology, when, when we had spoke a few days ago, you, you had said something that made me catch my breath. Um, I was actually clutching my virtual pearls, as it were. <laughs> where, where, exactly. <laughs> where, where, where you had said something to the effect of, I'm a believer in centralization of data management. I am. I, I, I am a believer in, in central data, decentralized analytic, a strong believer. Um, I know there's a situation where it's just physically not possible by sheer number of people and et cetera. But I think the only way to truly standardize on the language of data, it has to be, it has to have very strong guardrails. I, I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, and, and you drew a really important distinction there that I don't think enough of us draw which is you, you said decentralized analytics, centralized data management. Yep. And, and, and I think that's a really, really important distinction. And, and I think when we use these terms and we talk about data mesh or data fabric or in, insert shiny thing here, we don't draw enough of a distinction between what are we talking about here, right? Are we talking about analytics? Because we've been doing that for decentralizing analytics. We've been doing that for decades. Yep. I mean, we call it a data, um, a, a data, you know, you can call it a data mesh or a data mart or or whatever. I mean, we were calling it data marts 20 years ago where, where, where marketing groups could go build their own stuff. But I think that distinction is 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 meaningful. And I think we should we should be more specific when we talk about these things, because like, I don't think we are. But it, for example, the data mesh is absolutely positively an analytical paradigm. Mm -hmm. Like hard, hard stop. It says so in like the first paragraph of Zomok's book about the data mesh. So. Very important distinction. Let's drill down a little bit. Um, when you talk about centralized data management, um, I mean, I, I assume you're talking about things like MDM, data quality, all, all the other kind of the, exactly. Kind of you know, talk, but common tech. definitions, conceptual models. This thing is. This is what it means, and this is where you can get data about it. Uh, just so as as an analyst or data scientist, you go to the same place to get the same data as everybody else, right? So that's how I think about it. Uh, but then what you do with it is you can implement that data in whichever way you need it to, right? Um, this is kind of like now we're getting into this like monetizing data, but not from like selling perspective, but actually using it for various different purposes. I love the idea. Do you think it's feasible? Um, it is incredibly hard, uh, and it's always a push and pull when you go into this, when you go into anything that's centralized, then you're viewed as a bottleneck, period. Uh, but, but it's like there in order, like for us as a society, like I'm going to like this whole historical lesson, part of being, when you're a member of a society, you have to follow a set of rules. That's how we all, you know, share toys in the sandbox. So if you want to use the sandbox and play with the toys, you have to like follow some rules. And I know some people don't like to follow rules and that'll always be happening, but, but that's okay. Uh, if we do want to collectively be able to safely use things and reuse and repurpose, we have to accept the fact that sometimes things will be slower, but for a reason. I mean, there are traffic lights, right? Like, oh, you know, oh my God, I'm stopped at the red light. It's slow, but it's there for a reason. Well, that, that, sounds, that sounds like 
you know, well, it sounds reasonable. And it sounds like, you know, reasonable <laughs> compromise, but it also sounds like a little bit of a sacrifice that maybe often yeah. people don't want to make. They want to have their cake and eat it too. But I mean, th th there's, there's countless metaphors here, right? I love the societal metaphor because you could easily think about the power grid, the roads, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, uh, water and sewage infrastructure, like, Go, go build your own, go try to build your own roads and your old, own infrastructure and your own, you know, healthcare system and, and on and on, because there's, there's not going to be any economies of scale. That's the whole thing about centralization. It, it exists for a reason and it, it exists because it provides economies of scale that are not there in highly decentralized worlds. Yeah. The other thing is like what I've heard recently, I was on a podcast, somebody said, oh, security is a massive bottleneck. Like that, that's not a good way to look at it. Security is not a bottleneck. Security is, is actually what you want to do. And it's it's part of delivering something. I'm like, would you have a house without a front door? Would you want anybody off the street to go into your house? Because it's not about like you remove the bottleneck. Oh my God, you no longer have to knock or ring a doorbell, but like, do you really not want to have a front door? Um, so it, it's, I think it's a, perception of like what is fast what is bottleneck right like things take time and it's an acceptable time to take to do things a certain way because you're optimizing right the economies of scale it's safe it's whatever that may be so I'm like i don't look at it as a bottleneck it just kind of like changing how you think about things how much of this do, do you do you think how how much of this may be craze or hype or maybe obsession is too strong of a word. I think it might be too strong of a word. We're, we're talking a lot about words today. Um, but this obsession towards like decentralized everything, how much do you of, of that do you think is coming from vendors? Are you hearing that on the vendor side? I am. So I've, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic by nature. I don't like this whole, whatever vendors are selling me, I take it with a grain of salt always. So I am not in the camp of blaming vendors for everything. We're all adults. We should be able to make our own decisions and, and you know, figure things out. I think to me, and again, maybe it's based on my experience, I worked with software engineers a ton. And they've always looked at me as the bottleneck. And that was actually, um, and they're always also went from monolith to microservices. I've seen this play out a long time ago, uh, and I've worked with software engineers, which I don't know if you, I mean, you were in product. where uh, I, every, I managed a team of software engineers right. for a long so time. So you yeah. know this whole thing of like, oh, I can do better. Oh, you're blocking me. You're slowing me down. I, I'm better. I'm better than this. I'm better than this person. I'm better than the software. I think it's just us as humans being humans. I, I don't, it, you, you, especially as you kind of like, maybe when you're younger, you're like, idealistic and you think you can do better and then you like reinvent the wheel for a few times and you realize like first of all it's boring <laughs> like why do something that's already done and then you also learn and you realize that some things are better left to others um focus on what you're good at and then let others do what they're good at um so this kind of also comes with maturity well that 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 kind of aligns to some of the insights you shared with me when we were talking a few days ago, I, th I think you called it like your, your martial arts approach. Oh, it's Joe Reese is actually called it MMA. Oh, it's Joe. Oh, it's, oh, yeah, oh so Joe. And, and, okay, Joe, okay. Joe, I'm like, nod, I'm nod, totally nod. running with it. Okay. What, what, okay. <laughs> to me, I actually, I use slightly different phrase. Um, I, what I share with you is I, I don't do yoga. My mind's too active. But this one time that I took yoga and, and the thing that I took away from it is, and when we were kind of like relaxing at the end, she said, Take what you need and leave what you don't. And that's exactly it. Take what you need from the tooling perspective, the pattern, pa patterns and methodologies that work to solve the problem that's in front of you. Stop obsessing about all the other things. We make things work, right? Like it, it's not a vendor, it's not a consultant. You actually uh, <laughs> talk about, you asked me about consultants in the past, um, and I haven't answered that question, but well, so, yeah. go ahead. Go, yeah, go, so... go ahead. Hey, Veronica, I'm a, I'm a consultant. 
and I'm here and I want to help solve all of your problems. And the first thing we're going to do is an eight month long maturity assessment and we'll, we'll put together a roadmap. We're going to do we're going to do, uh, uh, you know, gap assessment to understand where you want to be versus where you are. Um, what do you what do you say? Um, Sign on the t on the dotted line. <laughs> what I'll say is, is what you can give me tomorrow. <laughs> um, OK, consultants versus full time employees versus, you know, vendors selling their product. We all have a specific business goal and responsibility as a consultant, right? Like you just said, oh, it's going to take me eight months. And I said, I need you to deliver ABC in three. And I'm not. And you're like, but this is a bad idea to do it right. I need eight months, but I'm paying you. And like, I need it in three months. So you deliver what you can. It's not necessarily your fault. At the same time, <laughs> generally, I walk in after something was delivered like that, and then I have to fix it. So it's it's such an interesting relationship. Uh, and the same with, you know, vendor sale and product. They want to make a sale. I get it. I appreciate it. They potentially exaggerate things. I also understand it. But it's, again, I put it on me and my team to do real evaluation, to, to do the matrix, to understand what this tool gives us and what it's lacking. And then we accept the trade-offs when we make our choice. And I'm not gonna walk around and blame a tool for you know, all every single problem that I have. It's, it's really on us, how we use this tool, why we brought it in, was it the right tool for us? And did we realize that the trade-offs that we accepted were actually a bigger deal than we thought they were? Exactly. I think often, and I'd love I'd love your perspective on this. I think often we're just not being honest to ourselves about why we're hiring the consultants in the first place. Yep. Right, right. Like there's a lot of reasons to hire consultants. And don't get me wrong, a lot of the people who watch this listen to this podcast are consultants. A lot of the people who are engaged with me on LinkedIn are consultants. I've been a consultant. They play an incredibly important role. But but I think I think, you know, when I look at am I am I something you mentioned earlier? You said, you said, which is just fabulous, by the way, you said, you know, you've got a reasonably high level of self-awareness and I would agree. And you're not, you said, you're not very good at strategy. So that would be a great time to sit down with a consultant who maybe is, right? Mm -hmm. And if that's the reason why, and that's what you're hiring them for, then, then, then fantastic. Maybe you've, maybe you haven't, you got holes in your organization. You don't have people, you don't have the people in the chairs that you need to have in the chairs and you need to augment your staff and you need to have some consultants for that. That's great. They're, they can be very, very effective at that. But, but often I think a lot of the times consultants are just being hired as a checkbox or as, as what I would call when I was a Gartner, a halo, right? Which, which, is, which is the somebody else is, I'm using this other group, insert name here, it doesn't matter, to, to, to bolster my business case or to, to build my credibility or to build the credibility of this program. And that's a different thing. So I don't know, what, what, as, as you're listening to me rant about this, what, what, what are you thinking? Um, it's both. No, I, I do agree. Like we have to be honest with ourselves hundred percent. And it's like consultants are not, you, you have to be self-aware. You have to understand what your team is and what it isn't and go from there. Um, I've seen consultants hired where like, there is a project it needs to get done. We don't want to hire full-time staff. We would just want to temporarily bring somebody in. But that's a short term engagement, which means that whatever, you know, consultants deliver, somebody has to support. If that conversation hasn't happened, that's what I've seen fail. So the things are like thrown overboard, like here now you support and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> what is this? I don't know anything about it. Why was it built this way? Like, again, like it all comes down. And I don't know if you think about it. I think about it a ton. It's like psychology of a human. Like at the end of the day. It's two humans working together, and we all know that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, in, indeed. Getting back to your, your metaphor before about the relationship between you and a company, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's good and sometimes it yep. can be dysfunctional. We're, we're running low on time. I do want to ask one more question because this, this piqued my interest earlier when we were talking about data management, and we've talked a lot today about language. Um, you talked about learning English and we've talked about having a common language and learning words. And when it comes to data management, that's obviously important when we start talking about things like centralization and having common definitions and data models and, and on and on. 
Have you thought at all about how, how AI would throw a wrench into this or maybe help or complicate or or, or what? what? What's your perspective on, on AI and, and our development of a common language? So if we can deliver or, or come up with a common language, then AI can supplement automating a lot of other things. But I don't think AI will solve our common language problem. At least I can't see it happening at, the, at this point in time. I don't know, maybe at some point AI will be this magical thing and a robot that like understands us, but like grasping the context, the the nuances, the the translations of how like I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is we, st we, we still have to talk to each other and agree on things before AI can step in and automate some things. Awesome. Next time we're together, um, we can share a beverage and, ha and have a, a more detailed talk about that because I, I, I want to convince you otherwise. But I could be compl completely and totally wrong. I, I, I think that there could be something there maybe one day because they seem to be, AI seems to be pretty good at language, but I, I think there's universal consensus and you and I would agree on this, that it's never going to be 100%. No way. Like, no way. I, 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 think, I, think, I think what maybe it's the 30%, right? That would be cool, it even if we just got the 30%. It, it, and also, I also mentioned that I'm a skeptic. <laughs> so I, I like, I'm going to say something that's probably going to like totally like date me. I wait until service back one. I always wait until things kind of like settle down, stabilize. Somebody else will do the, the hype, test it all out. And then I'm going to be like, okay, now this is a little bit more stable. Let's really think through how this can be implemented. And I'm still learning that 30% of the AI language, right? Like I, I don't, have a full like 30 percent understanding of what it actually does how it works so i'm still on that journey yeah well even the people that build it aren't even sure how it works so you're in good company <laughs> all right on that um veronica thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to talk with us my, my apologies we had some technical glitches at the, at the beginning hopefully that doesn't actually show but thank you for taking time out thank you so much for having me always a pleasure Wonderful. And to our audience, our listeners, our viewers of the CDO, Matter po CDO Matters podcast, too much coffee this morning. I'm speaking quickly. Uh, thank you so much. If you could, I would be thrilled if you take the time to subscribe to the podcast so you get auto automatic notifications from Spotify, Google, Apple, you name it, wherever you consume your podcasts. My thanks again to Veronica. Thanks to our listeners. We will see you on another episode very soon. Thanks all.